Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. The test of faith. We don't get what we want the moment that we want it. God leads us the long hard way because many times we're not ready for the thing that God's got ready for us. I want to talk to you about being interrupted by God. <laughs> yes. Well, we can kind of see that everybody needs that, right? <laughs> you know, um, most of us have some kind of a plan for the day. I mean, I know there are people who just kind of fly by the seat of their pants and they never know what they're going to do, but, you know, most of us have some kind of a plan. And how about if we start the day by lifting our plan up to God and saying, now this is what I have planned, but I just want you to know I'm available for you. And if at any time you need to interrupt my plan because you need me to do something else, then please help me hear you and be quick to obey. How many of you think that sounds good? You know, I always say that if you want to be used by God, you don't need ability, you just need availability. You'd be amazed how many people think they can't do anything for God because they can't find any special talent they have, but God can give you the talent to do whatever He wants you to do if you're just available. Interrupted by God. God rarely asks us to do anything when it's convenient. Actually, when he calls, he seems to not care too much at all about what we're doing. Because whatever we're doing is not as important as what God wants us to do. I must say that one more time. Whatever we're doing is not nearly as important as what God wants us to do. Amen. So, Paul told Timothy to preach the gospel in season or out whether it was convenient or inconvenient. But there's a little something else I want you to see about 2 Timothy 4, 2, because I think in some instances we've gotten a little bit off track, and if we go to church and we hear anything other than something that just makes us feel good, then we don't like the sermon. But Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out, reprove, which means correct, rebuke, which means correct a little bit harder, <laughs> and exhort, which means to edify and make people feel good about themselves. But I tell you, if, if, if you go to a church where your behavior is never confronted and where you can always just be really comfortable, I think sometimes, well, I kind of enjoy making people squirm in their seats a little bit. You know, it's kind of, you, you can kind of tell when you're saying something that people would really rather not hear. But you know, it's the stuff that we would rather not hear that we need to hear. And you know, most people who teach or preach, they love it when people say amen or they're shaking their heads. And Dave always tells me, don't be so concerned about everybody clapping and saying amen about everything you say. They clap for the stuff they already know and agree with when they're quiet. Come on. When they're quiet, you're saying something that's kind of like, uh-oh, am I understanding this right? You know, a lot of times when God begins to deal with us about something that is going to be a little bit uncomfortable for us, we, we tell God, oh, no, not that. I'm, I'm not ready for that yet. But whatever God wants to deal with us about, there's an anointing at that time for God to deal with us about that thing. And many times we want to wait for our own timing and then things can be really, really, really difficult. You know, after we're born again, our number one job is to grow up. <laughs> Amen? And we need more mature Christians and 
Mature Christians are stable. They're not up and down and all over the place based on what their circumstances are doing. And mature Christians are very prompt about obeying God because they know that God is smarter than they are and that His way is always best. Well, Felix was a man who'd been hearing about the gospel and hearing about Paul in particular, and he wanted to learn more. And so in Acts 24, 25, it says, and as he reasoned, Paul went to him and he says, and he reasoned with him about righteousness, which I guess challenged Felix's behavior, and about self-control, and he tried to talk to him about the upcoming judgment. You see, I think we need to be reminded more often that the day will come for every one of us, not some of us, every one of us, when we will stand before God and give an account of our life. The day will come for every one of us and I think we need to think about that sometimes. When we will stand before God and give an account of our lives. Now, obviously, if we're true believers in Jesus Christ, this judgment is not gonna be about whether or not we're gonna get into heaven. But I think for Christians, it's important what we do with our time. I think it's important how we treat people. How many of you think that how you treat people is important to God? Can I tell you something? I think it's the most important thing to God. I think the way we treat other people, especially people who can't do anything for us, especially people who can't do anything for us, I think it says more about our character than probably anything else. We need to get about the business of loving one another and not just talking about loving one another. Amen? So I guess in a way today is a little bit about calling all of us to a higher level of obedience. And uh, obedience really is always a sacrifice. It's some kind of sacrifice. If God asks me to do something for somebody, it's going to take some of my time, it's going to take some of my money, it's going to take some of my effort. If I want to grow tomatoes, which I don't, but if I did, <laughs> and I had a package of tomato seeds, I could not ever have a garden full of tomatoes unless I sacrificed my seed. And so, seed, of course, can be money, it can be time, but I believe that every act of obedience or disobedience is a seed that we sow that will bring a harvest in our life. It'll either bring a harvest that we really like or it will bring a harvest that we don't like. The word convenient, and let me just say that I think in our society we're pretty addicted to convenience and comfort. Most of us, you know, we just, we're just not always very tough. You know, you go to some of these other places like third world countries or developing countries and and I mean, the things that they don't have, and many of them are happier than we are with all the stuff that we've got. Matter of fact, one of the things we complain about is all the stuff we have that we have to take care of. <laughs> so, um, we need to get ready to obey God quickly and do whatever it is He wants us to do. In Ecclesiastes 11.4, it says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. And really what that is basically saying is if you, when God asks you to do something, if you won't do it unless all of your circumstances are perfect, then you'll never end up sowing, and if you don't sow, you'll never end up reaping. So we... We need to get the understanding that God purposely puts us in positions very often in life where we won't like it 
and it's not convenient, and it's not comfortable, and even though we do not understand the purpose, there is a purpose for what God is doing. And it's usually got something to do with our spiritual growth. Now, I'll tell you a story. There was a great preacher around the turn of the century called Billy Sunday. Anybody ever hear of Billy Sunday? Okay. He was like the Billy Graham of that day. And he had been a professional baseball player. And um, he heard the gospel, got saved, and felt called to be an evangelist. And so he just became a great, great, great man of God. Now, leaving that there for a minute, there was a local pastor, pastor of a local church in Chicago, which is where Billy Sunday was also from. And one night, he woke up in the middle of the night and felt like God was telling him to go down to the Chicago train station and preach in the middle of the night. Well, he thought, well, that's silly, and rolled over and went back to sleep. And it wasn't very long, and same thing happened again. And he thought, well, that that's ridiculous. What sense does that make? Rolled over and went back to sleep, and in a few minutes woke up and still felt the same thing. I wonder how many times God gives us an opportunity to do something, but because we think it's silly. <laughs> or it doesn't make any sense, we just kind of blow it off and don't do it. Well. I guess the man was mature enough to finally realize it was God talking to him, and although it didn't make any sense at all, he gets up in the middle of the night, gets dressed, goes down to the train station, and he ends up actually one level below where the trains were running. And there was nobody down there, but he just preached a, a gospel message, just a plain, basic gospel message. As far as he knew, he was not preaching to anybody. Didn't see anybody, didn't hear anybody. Went back home, went to bed. Never had any idea why he was there or what was going on. Well, years later, he went to a Billy Sunday meeting. And Billy told how he was saved. And he said, yeah, one night in the middle of the night, I was at the Chicago train station. And uh, I heard somebody preaching. I couldn't see him, but I heard him preaching the gospel. And that's when I received Christ and God called me to be an evangelist. <laughs> so I want you to remember that when you're out and about, you are the hands and feet of Jesus. And I can tell you the work that needs to be done in the world is not going to be done by a handful of preachers on a platform. We have to train you up that you go out and do the work of the ministry. And so I'd like you to really just make a decision today that you're going to agree with God to be promptly obedient to what He tells you. And I'm not suggesting just doing stupid things without checking it out or, you know, if something sounds really weird, then I would pray about it more than once, but always remember, just because it doesn't make any sense to you doesn't mean that it's not God. Just because it doesn't make any sense to you doesn't mean that it's not God. We try to apply our human understanding to what we sense in our heart that God wants, but God's thoughts are above our thoughts, and His ways are above our ways. I remember a time when I was going to lunch with a friend. And I had another friend that I went to lunch with a lot. Her and I actually spent a lot of time together. And now I'm going to lunch with this other person. But I kept feeling like I should invite this other friend to go. And um, in one way, I really kind of wanted to spend some private time with this other friend. But because I really felt like it was God, I thought, okay. So I called her and I asked her, her name was Joan. I said, Joan, would you like to go to lunch with me and so-and-so today? She said, oh, I would love to. I appreciate you asking, but I'm spending the day with my mom. Well, I was a younger believer then, and so that kind of confused me. And I said to God, well, you know, I thought you, I felt so sure that you told me to ask her to lunch. He said, I did. I didn't tell you she'd go. I just told you to ask her. <laughs> Thank you.
Come on, is anybody ready to start obeying God, even if it doesn't really make a lot of sense to you? See, I believe that life can and should be and will be a real adventure if we really every day say to God, I'm available for you, whatever you want. It could be smiling at someone. It could be telling somebody that the color they've got on looks good on them. I don't think we realize how many people out in the world are desperate just to believe that somebody sees them. So, we're going to obey God, whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient. Now, let's look at a few people that God called at very inconvenient times and see how they responded. Oh, and by the way, do you know that as far as I can tell, every person that Jesus healed, he was on his way to do something else. Come on, I want you to understand that. He was headed to Jerusalem and blind Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, help me. And the Bible says, the Amplified Bible says, and Jesus stood still. Don't you love that? He's going somewhere, and he stood still. I wonder how many times we're in a rush to get somewhere that's really not even all that important. And we pass by the man lying on the side of the road bleeding because we've got our plan, and we don't want to be inconvenienced. Wonder how many more people we could help if we were willing to make a little bit of a sacrifice to do it. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Now, you know, we read this stuff, and I don't think that we think that much about it, but if you really stop and think about this, how amazing is that? They didn't, I guess, didn't know who Jesus was. Maybe they'd heard about him. Maybe they hadn't heard about him. And I don't know, maybe we could say, well, there must have been something really special about Jesus that people would do that. But whatever the case is, they had a plan. These people were businessmen. They had fishing businesses. If we go on and read, verse 21 says, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father <laughs> and followed him. They just walked off from everything, like when God called Abram to leave everything that he knew and was comfortable with and go to a place that I will show you. He wouldn't even tell them where he was, where he was going to send him. And if we get around to it, you'll see. I mean, Abraham basically just wandered around for years and years. And, you know, he'd pitch a tent one place, and then pretty soon God would tell him to move, and he'd pitch a tent somewhere else, and God would tell him to move. And, you know, he's doing all this stuff because God had told him, if you'll do this, I'll bless you and I'll make you a blessing. Well, how many of us are willing to wait for years? <laughs> the test of faith. We don't get what we want the moment that we want it. God leads us the long, hard way because many times we're not ready for the thing that God's got ready for us. God may have something really major for you to do, but maybe you're not spiritually mature enough yet to handle it, so God has to take you a couple of trips in the wilderness. Come on. Because we don't grow up in our good times, we grow up in hard times. That's when we do our growing, when it's inconvenient, when it's uncomfortable, when people are not treating us nice and we love them anyway when they keep hurting us over and over and because God said to, we forgive them, even though we don't think it's right or fair and it doesn't feel good, we need to start doing things just because God said to do it and we don't have to know why or when we're gonna get a breakthrough.
always allow God to interrupt our lives anytime He wants to. We should lift up our plans to Him each day and be sensitive to what it is that He wants us to do. Meer dan 10 miljoen gevangenen zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory prison. I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen en Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for a third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, "I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls." A lot of people don't have family here, so they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away, um, that somebody does value us still, and that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht. Zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. In het leven lopen we hier en daar butsen en schrammen op. Sponsor over. Maar sommige beschadigingen kunnen het leven volledig lam leggen. Hoe overwin je woede en bitterheid? Lees het boek van Joyce Meyer. Doe jezelf een plezier. Vergeef. En start bevrijd aan je toekomst. Bestel je boek. Doe jezelf een plezier. Vergeef. Via joyce-meijer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Hoe zit het met een dagelijkse verfrissing? Frisse Impulsen levert de dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce per e-mail. Meld je gratis aan.